This morning we're going to finish up with this particular series. It's been entitled The Search for Meaning. And Solomon had looked at life and Solomon had lived life in the fullest, experienced everything imaginable. He was most likely the wealthiest man of his day. He could have, as we would say, anything money could buy. He could experience with his power, he could experience anything that he desired. And yet he came up, as we talked about in the first chapter, with this phrase that is probably the most famous phrase of Ecclesiastes, and that is that all is vanity. He couldn't find anything in and of itself that is done in this life that he said, oh, well, that will fulfill your every purpose. And so we come to the conclusion in verse 13 of chapter 12. It says, let us hear the, whole con the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So in looking at life, he found that life is a meaningless experience without God. He found that all the things that you can do in life, whether it's have wealth or spend wealth, have power and exercise power, that all of those things, that if God is not in the equation, it becomes meaningless. And so the only thing that really gives value to life then is our relationship with God. That makes everything else. And the way that he describes it here is, and it's common in the wisdom literature, is what he calls the fear of God. Now the fear of God is not something that we in Western society focus on. We like the love of God much better. We like love because we want God to love us. And God does love us. But God loves the whole world. And just because God loves the whole world doesn't mean that the whole world loves God. And just because God loves people doesn't mean that they have a relationship with him. All that means is that because God loves the whole world, that he makes a way for any of us who desire to have a relationship. But in order to have a meaningful relationship, we have this concept called, as Solomon puts it here, the fear of God. Now, the fear of God doesn't mean to live in terror it doesn't mean that, oh, I'm scared of God. It means that I have a respect, an awe, a reverence for God. In the book of Proverbs, it would talk about it like this, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. In other words, it's a recognition that things are important and that God has a prominent place in our life. Imagine if you will, if you were at work and you're there working and you may be working by yourself and all of a sudden you look up and you see your employer there looking at you, observing you, studying you. You're sitting there and your first thought is, I hope I'm doing the right thing. Well, how much more should we feel 
in the presence of an omnipresent God who is, as the psalmist said, I can go to the highest mountain and you are there. I can go to the lowest depth and you are there. Wherever I go, you are. So, the fear of the Lord then becomes what? It, the fear of God becomes a matter of context. In other words, it becomes the context for our life. It becomes the measure, if you would, by how I judge my life. It becomes that relationship that I have with God where I understand that He is present in my life. And so he becomes the context of my life. I'm recognizing that he is there. The second thing about the fear of the Lord does, it puts us in our place. Because you see, when I have a relationship with God and I understand that he's God and I'm not, there are too many people who try to think, they try to treat God in a host of different ways. I remember when I was a child, I treated God as almost this magical power, like a genie in a lamp, where I remember I was watching uh, a friend of mine who was playing in a, in a baseball game one time, and it was, in the, it was for the championship, and I wanted him to win so badly. I started praying, and I started negotiating with God. And for many of us, that's the way our prayer life begins. I want something so bad. God, if you just let them win, I'll do this, and then I'll do that. And then as they get further behind, I increase the ante. God, please, you've got to show up. Eventually, we learn that God is not someone that we bargain with. We find out that those kind of prayers don't seem to move God at all. Eventually, we learn that there's someone on the other side who's praying the same kind of prayer. And they're both asking us for a victory, and God's up there thinking, well, I can't please you both. And eventually, we learn that, you know, a game is just a game. And the outcome, God may be up there just watching just like the rest of us. Even though he already knows what's going to happen, he's not going to put his hand in. Because his children are on both sides a lot of times. So when we understand the fear of the Lord, then, that under, then I begin to understand that God is much more than my personal answerer who can help make my life more happy and give me what I want. It puts me in my proper place where I understand that God is not here to serve me, but rather I am here to serve him. And so I've, that's called wisdom, in case you didn't know it. The other thing about the fear of the Lord is it puts all other things in their place. There are a lot of things as we look at life that we can start worrying about. We can worry about the problems with terrorists because that's a real issue in our day. We can worry about problems with the weather as we've experienced in the last few weeks in different parts of our country. We can start worrying about all these other things in life. You can start worrying about your job. You can start worrying about your home. You can start worrying about your neighbors. You can start worrying about anything that you want to. I can give you something, and no matter how safe you may be, you can start worrying about it. But when you have the fear of the Lord in your life, you don't worry about this other stuff. <laughs> 
We have a great example of that with Paul on his trip to Rome. You see, he understood in his relationship with God that God was there and that God was real and that God, in fact, could look into the future and God could see certain things. And if he chose to, he could reveal them. And he revealed to Paul, Paul, you are going to Rome. Now, between the time that Paul found out that he was going to Rome, when God revealed that to him, Paul was arrested. Paul was put in jail. Paul was put on a ship. The ship sailed into a hurricane. The ship sank. And Paul was never worried about all those things. In fact, as the night on the hurricane, when he realized the ship is, things are getting bad, Paul prayed and God showed him. He said, look, the ship is going to sink, but because you've prayed and because you've asked, I'm going to allow everyone, and it was over 200 souls on that ship, I'm going to let everyone live because you have interceded. And Paul stood up while everybody else was in terror and while everybody else was afraid. And Paul told them, you're going to live. On a practical matter, he also told them, you need to eat to keep up your strength because you're going to have to swim because the boat's going down. Paul got to the island uh, they landed on of Malta. They're in the middle of the Mediterranean. He started gathering sticks. And unknown to him, he gathered a poisonous snake among the sticks. And as he brought it to the fire, the snake, being a cold-blooded animal, got enough warmth to where it could finally move a little bit. And it bit Paul on the wrist. And everybody around him thought, wow, he lived through the shipwreck, but now he's going to die. Was Paul worried? No, he had the promise of God. God told me I'm going to Rome. No snake, ship didn't stop me. Hurricane didn't stop me. No snake's going to stop me as well. And so he, the Bible says he just simply shook the snake off into the fire. Why? Because he understood that God was bigger than the snake. He understood that God was bigger than the hurricane. He understood that God was bigger than all the powers and all the forces that were there in the world. And that as he would say in the book of Romans, if God be for you, who can be against you? If God wants you someplace and you're willing to go there, guess what? You will be there. And so it puts everything else in place. You understand, I don't have to be afraid of all the things that everybody else is terrified of. Paul was even afraid when you get into the book of Philippians there as he was facing imprisonment. He was even imprisoned by the Romans. Paul looked at his life and he told the Philippians as he wrote to them, here's how I look at life. If I live, I live for Christ. If I die, well, guess what? I'm going to be with Christ. I win, I win. There's nothing that you can do to make me lose. He goes on and dwells in the Philippians because at that time he was under what was known as house arrest. And so every morning they would have different Roman soldiers who would come and they would literally chain themselves to the Apostle Paul. And so that he couldn't go and do all the things that was his form of imprisonment. Paul didn't look at I'm chained to this soldier. Paul looked at it. He's chained to me. I can talk to him about Jesus all day long. He can't leave. You see, when you understand where God is, then it puts everything else in its place. And you understand, it doesn't mean that you don't go through unpleasant things. You just understand, well, if I'm going through this unpleasantness right now, God has a purpose. God has a reason. I may not understand it. I may not know it. But I am trusting God to be the Lord of my life. And so when you have that fear of God, then you understand what God says is important. And what God does is important. And I'm not going to worry about all the other stuff. 
So it starts off with the fear of the Lord. But the second thing that he says here is keep his commandments. Obedience is key to the walk of faith. And see, this is where, as I said earlier, we like that aspect of God where we say, God, I just want to love you and I just want you to love me. And God says, if you love me, you will obey me. You remember Jesus saying that? If you really love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And you know that works in any sort of relationship. I mean, sometimes you may get your back up and like husbands will sometimes and say, oh, I'm not going to obey my wife. Good luck. <laughs> I remember a few years ago, Sheila and I were both giving blood at a blood bank and uh, we were sitting there and the girl found out that we had been married for a great number more years than she'd been alive. And she looked at me and she said, how do you do this? What is the secret? And I said, you learn to say yes, ma'am. <laughs> and that's key in any relationship. I understand, and that's what mutual submission means. I understand that, hey, if I don't please her, she's not going to be happy with me. And hopefully during the years she's learned if she doesn't please me, I'm not going to be very happy either. Obedience is the key to the walk of faith. And if that's true in a human relationship, how much more is it true in our relationship with God? Saul found that out when he decided to make excuses. And he said, well, I'm going to sacrifice. And Samuel had to remind him, obedience is better than sacrifice. So the most important thing that I can tell you to do is to learn to obey God. God. If you learn to obey God, that will keep you out of a bunch of trouble in this world and the life to come. Oh yeah, we might like to understand. We might like to understand all this other stuff. But a lot of times you don't understand what you're doing or why you're doing it. But you understand this is what God wants me to do and therefore I will do it and so obedience then is the key to the walk of faith if I'm going to believe in God then I need to obey him and without obedience our relationship is meaningless now what is it in its simplest form it's this it's choosing God's way over our way. You know, as long as God is telling us to do what we want to do, that's no big issue. It's like if my dad said when I was growing up, hey, we're going to Six Flags. It's like, oh, yes, Dad, I am your most obedient child. I will go with you. I have no problem hanging around. You're going to pay for everything, right? That's the joy of being a parent. You get to pay for everything. But you see, where it matters is when my way is different than God's way. And yet I still choose God's way. There are a lot of rules that we come up with as we read through the Bible. We may look at them and they say, oh, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't comprehend it. We well, don't have to comprehend everything, but it's still better if you obey everything. Comprehension usually comes years later. It's amazing how we struggle because basically... Most of us, as we are born and we become a 
an infant and start growing up and become a toddler. You know, all children have this in common. They're selfish. They want their way. The most unpleasant word that we learn in the human language is no. But I want what I want. Sorry, no. And as a child, we mature into adulthood when we learn no. And we're told you don't always get your way. And so when we voluntarily choose that, you know, I believe God knows more about my life than I do. And even though this is something I would really like, I hear God telling me, no. So what do I do? I have a choice. Do I choose to do it my way or do I choose to do it God's way? And it's very easy for us to understand and to rationalize and try and figure out a way where I can get my way. But God's way is always the best. You see, when you keep his commandments, it is the highest form of love. You can talk about loving God, but love is a word that has become empty in our relationships. Because we say, all I've got to do is say, I love you. But if you ever notice that the way God links the word love, he always links it with an action. Think about the most famous verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only begotten son. In other words, God said, here's how I love you. I have given you something. Love is always linked with an action. Well, what is the highest form of love? If I'm going to say that I love God, a proper way of saying that is, God, I love you and therefore I choose to obey you. Then I have proof of my love. I remember years ago, I was talking with a lady and she had, uh, her and her husband were having problems because he was living in another state and he wouldn't come here to live with her and she kept telling me, but he says uh, that he loves me. I said, well, what does his actions say? His actions are saying that he's choosing to live somewhere else instead of living with you. I said, I don't know about you, but I said, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of love. If I keep telling someone, oh, I love you and I want you to be a part of my life, but I'm sorry, I can't do a little thing like just move where you're at. That doesn't speak very highly of love to me. You see, love is always going to be proven by your actions, by the things that you do. And our, if we're going to say that we love God, then you need to be prepared to prove that you love God. And the highest way that you can prove that you love God is when you say, God, I love you and therefore I obey you. It's interesting the way that Solomon finishes this out in the last verse where he says, for God will bring every work into judgment. He'd said earlier in the book of Ecclesiastes that one of the greatest places of wisdom that we can go to is in the, what he called the house of mourning. That's something that I usually mention at every funeral that I do because God says this is a place where you can really learn wisdom because this is something that all of us need to prepare for. It's amazing how many of us will prepare for our physical death 
we'll prepare. Okay, well, I want to go and make all the funeral arrangements, and I want to do it this way and do that. And if what I've noticed about people as they get older and as they get, if they're going through an illness, as they get sicker, one of the things that they'll do is that a lot of times they'll call me in and say, Pastor, this is what I want at my funeral. I always take note of it. I always write it down. And so we prepare for that. But how many of us prepare to face God? How many of us prepare for judgment? You see, Solomon put it like this. So much of life is vanity. It is meaningless. So, much, so many of the things that we do really have little or no meaning in the long term. So if so much of life is vanity, then guess what? God will decide what is important. God will decide what is important. It's amazing how many people don't understand what's important in their lives. We don't understand what is an important experience in our lives. I remember years ago I read the story of a famous man who talked about, and he talked about that there was one day as a child that he had spent with his dad where they were just together, and he said it would just had affected him in just such a profound way. It was interesting. They researched, and the man's father had kept a journal, and in the journal he'd made an entry for that day, and in that day his journal entry was did nothing really important today see a lot of times we think what I'm doing today because it just seems so plain oh I might be just spending time with my family I just you know just like I've done a hundred days before and I'll do a hundred days after but we don't realize how important this particular day may be we don't realize the impact of what will happen. God will decide what is important. And sometimes the most important day of your life, you may not know it until you face God. And God will tell you what you did on this day. Change things. You don't know when you make a friend with someone what an impact you may have. You don't understand that, but if you're doing that fear God thing and keeping his commandments and you're doing things the way that God wants you to do, guess what? You'll find out that you were there on the day that you were supposed to be there and that you did something important because you were obeying God and you find out, wow. So we prepare for judgment and the last thing is just simply this live life in private as if it was open to all everybody has secrets I understand that there are things in our lives that we don't want other people to know Sometimes we need to learn valuable lessons because we all mess up. I remember a few years ago, I sent an email to someone about a certain situation, and I said, look, can you handle this for me? Because this person over here, and I named them because they had sent me a message, and I said, this person over here really needs some special attention because some people need special attention. And so if you can help me out, I would appreciate it. Well, by mistake, the email that I sent got forwarded to the person that I was talking about. You talk about egg all over your face, wanting to go and hide. And they were kind enough to let me know that they had received it and uh, sort of half-heartedly chuckled about uh, my less-than-tactful comment, let's say. Let's say. 
My first response was, how could the person that I sent this to make a mistake like that and embarrass me? And I thought, well, they made a mistake, obviously. They weren't thinking about what they were doing. And then I had a second thought that was much wiser than my first thought. My second thought was, hmm, what can I learn from this? And what I learned from that was, I will never put anything in an email that I'm not willing to have anybody at all read. And since that day, I've prided myself that it was like if someone comes in and looks at my emails, they're not going to find anything that will embarrass me because I've offended someone. You see, if you learn to live your life as much as you possibly can in open or as transparent as you can, where you don't have anything to hide, where you don't have anything to cover up, you're going to find that life is a lot easier. Now you see, that's exactly the relationship that we have with God. It takes a long time to learn that God already knows all the bad stuff that we've done. Now the good thing is that God has chosen to love us anyway. And that's a blessing in case you didn't know it. God says, I love you anyway. Yeah, I know you're going to mess up. I love you. We see that Jesus and Judas on the night before. Jesus is going out of his way to be nice to Judas, even though he knows, Judas, you're, gonna, you're about to get me. But I'm going to show you your last memory of me will be me reaching out my hand to you. And that's what I want you to remember. So God has already made that decision to love us, to choose us. So live your life. If you're really preparing for judgment, live your life in private if it was open to all. Because it is open to God. There's nothing that you can hide from Him. The problem is that when we hide stuff, a lot of times we try to hide it from ourselves. And we need that honest relationship with God where he can tell us this is your problem this is what you need to work on this is what you need to do and so Solomon has come to the end of his book and basically he said the only way you're going to find meaning in life is you got to have God in your life and without God there is no meaning there is no value in life but with God everything can become important with God in your life if you're giving a cup of water to someone who's thirsty that can become important with God in your life if you just put your arm around someone who's hurting that can become important with God, if you just do the things that he wants you to do, even though you don't understand why you're doing it, it can become important. Because God knows what is important. And so we trust him. And we fear him. And we obey him. And we come to the end of life as Paul would come to the end of his life. And these are his words. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and not to me only, but to all who love him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given to us today. Lord, today as we remember that, we thank you for all those who years ago did things to make this church possible, did things to bring this congregation of believers here today together. And God, help us to live our life in such a way that years from now, we will have made a difference because we have trusted in you and we have obeyed you. We pray and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. As you know, we allow questions. You text it in during the message. This first question is an excellent question. What is the difference between fearing God and not having a spirit of fear? A spirit of fear is something that will permeate your whole life. And when you have a spirit of the fear, you're going to be afraid of everything. No matter what it is. No matter how much people may tell you, you don't need to be afraid. When you have a spirit of fear, you just, oh, but this, this could happen. This is when you start looking in the future and you start saying, but, you know, it could do this, and it could do this, and it could do this, and it could do this. I put it, it's, it's along the same lines as these people who are going to tell us what the climate's going to be like 100 years from now, and they can't even get next week right. And yet we worry about stuff like that. When you have the fear of God, you're not afraid. You understand. It's, the only thing I can compare it to is the relationship you have and one of the most important relationships that you have is with your father. And I remember, you know, if, you, if anybody had a fear of Alfred Dickens in his life, it was me and my two brothers. Because we knew when he meant what he said. <laughs> but I'll never forget the most terrified moment of my life was when I got lost as a child when I was about five years old at, Atlanta, at the Grant Park Zoo in Atlanta, Georgia. I got lost, and there, was a, there were strangers everywhere. And I found my way back to our car. And this tells you what kind of days there were. The car wasn't locked, so I just... I was able to get into the back seat and I was sitting there as a five-year-old and I was crying and tears and just, but I'll never forget when I saw my dad, all the fear was gone. That's the difference. Okay, next question. Is this what Jesus meant when he said, go and learn what this means? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Yeah, that's part of it. Uh, the whole idea of I desire mercy and not sacrifice is that God wants us to be more like him instead of just trying to give him stuff. This is like me, at the, as I was telling you, at the ball field, bargaining with God. God doesn't want us to bargain. If any bargain that God wants, God says, I want all of you. That's the only bargain he cares about. All right. Next. What if I don't agree with God? Do I have to obey anyway? Why? Well, do you have to obey anyway? No. You can be wrong. <laughs> you can choose the wrong thing. God will allow you. That's what we mean by freedom of choice, free will. God will allow you to be wrong. In fact, he talks about it in uh, one of the Psalms. 
He talks about the children of Israel. He said, I gave you the desires of your heart, and as a result of that, you got your leanness of soul is the way the psalmist phrased it. In other words, you got what you wanted, and all it did was dry up your, sh your soul. So you can choose your own way. Just understand there's a price, and you will not enjoy it, no matter how much you think you want it. All right. Thank you. Hope you've enjoyed this series. It's been, I have truly enjoyed it myself. And uh, we're going to be starting something new next Sunday. God bless you. Brother Dan's going to come and dismiss us.